Um, I think we will go ahead and get started. So welcome to Origin Seminar for Monday, October 14th. Uh, today we are pleased to welcome Ishan Tu. Uh, he is um, coming from the University of Virginia. So Ishan received his bachelor's in physics and astronomy and mathematics from the University of Rochester. His undergraduate research was simulations of common envelope evolution with Dr. Adam Frank. And he also did an internship at Fermilab designing part of a particle accelerator. Um, he is currently a fifth year PhD student at the University of Virginia working with Professor Ji uh, Yun Lee on modeling circumstellar disk formation and evolution. So go ahead and take it away, uh, Ishan. Uh, thank you very much. That's the current over there. Hello. Everybody online. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about uh, the dynamics of star formation on, uh, across different scales from the envelope, disk, and uh, and the jets. And uh, the background is just a beautiful aurora a couple of days ago. Uh, it is also visible from here. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so star formation is, so let me just give it back to the background. Okay, good. Yeah, so star formation is a uh, process uh, across many scales. So star formation uh, starts from the collapse of a pre-stellar core to the formation of a protostar and a protostellar disk in the class zero and class one phase. In these early phases, the protostar and the protostellar disk are still deeply embedded in the protostellar envelope. And uh, in the class two phase, these protostellar envelope is depleted due to accretion Onto the uh, onto the form star and the disk, and subsequent evolution during the class two phase, uh, which is a uh, uh, basically the class three and planetary system phases, um, uh, uh, is the evolution that we that, that results in us basically today. So my research focuses on the earliest phase of star formation in, during the class zero and class one phase. So. Uh, the, so the evolution during these two phases is also evolution across uh, many scales. So we have the photocellular envelope scale on the order of 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4 AU, and we have the photocellular disk scale on the order of 100 AU, 10 to 100 AU. And, uh, in, and uh, just around the star, we have the outflow launching, so that's the uh, root of the outflow on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 1 AU. Ideally, uh, we want to do one big simulation, including all the physics, uh, going from uh, even a larger scale, from a uh, giant molecular cloud scale, all the way down to the, the, the star itself. But such a simulation is, uh, it cannot be completed within a PhD time scale. <laughs> so, uh, so we have to divide this problem up into uh, some smaller problems. So we basically just divide the problem into these uh, three different scales. And uh, this is... Interesting. Fascinating. Uh, I think we lost you. Oh, oh, I, oh I think I, yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think I, I, think I could there get stuff. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, so, so uh, we basically divide uh, these uh, evolution into three different scales. And so, in this talk, I will present three sets of simulation that I did during my PhD. Uh, each on one different scale and illustrate a key process in one of, in each of these scales. So on the larger scale, we have the protocellular envelope scale from the envelope to the formation of stars and disks. And in a disk scale, we have uh, the grand growth in disks. Uh, that's basically the first step towards planet formation. And uh, during the inner disk, uh, I will be talking about how jets are launched uh, 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 or how we model the jets. So let's start from the larger scale, from the envelope scale. So this is just a, a cartoon showing, showing the uh, envelope scale. So magnetic fields are detected in star-forming uh, cloud cores. So this is an observation of, uh, of magnetic fields in giant molecular cloud. And how does this magnetic field affect star formation is the, the question we will try to investigate. And on a related topic, how does uh, non-ideal MHD, uh, how does non-ideal MHD affect the star formation? So just to give a background for non-ideal MHD effect. So imagine you have some cloud uh, like this, threaded by magnetic field. Um, ideal MHD means that the magnetic field lines are coupled perfectly to the gas. So if I compress the gas, basically shrink it, then all these magnetic field lines will be retained. 
and the, and the distance between magnetic field lines will become uh, smaller because we compress it, which means that the magnetic field strength will be stronger. So that's the ideal MHD. Basically, the magnetic field is perfectly coupled to the gas. Now the MHD means that the magnetic field can be decoupled from the gas. So if I compress the cloud, then some of the magnetic field can be removed. Um, so basically, we only left with, for example, five magnetic field lines over there, and then the magnetic field strength won't be increased as much. So how does these uh, removal or redistribution of magnetic field affect star formation? So the, to investigate these two questions, we use the Athena++ simulation framework to conduct 90 MHD simulations and um, uh, from the uh, collapse of a molecular cloud core to the formation of stars and disks. So just to uh, give a uh, background on, uh, on the setup of the simulation. So we start from a 2000 AU radius uh, pseudo a uh, pseudo bonner ebersphere So this is basically a density flow profile with a plateau in the middle and then a slight drop off towards the edge. Uh, that's the density profile. Uh, with 0.5 solar mass, total mass, in this pseudo bonner ebersphere And we do have some initial rotation uh, of this uh, uh, pseudo bonner ebersphere And with or without turbulence, also to investigate the effect of turbulence. And this pseudo bonner ebersphere is threaded by the z-direction magnetic field to model uh, the effect of magnetic field. And uh, of course, we include the Nadia MHD effect. Uh, in, in particular, we include the antipolar diffusion uh, as the dominant uh, Nadia MHD effect in the polar satellite environments. So, um, so let's start from the simplest case. So basically, just with the magnetic field, with uh, gravity, and without any turbulence. So in this simplest case, we recovered the uh, well-known pseudo disk. So we have so in the cartoon over the, uh, in the uh, meridian place, plane slice over there, we have the star and the real disk at the center. So that's the structure about 50 AU uh, uh, around the center, and then surrounding it is a equatorial denser structure that we can see. That's basically the redder structure over here, and that's the pseudo disk. So it is a pseudo disk because it is kind of like a disk uh, that is flat and uh, and circular, uh, but it's also it's not rotation rotationally supported like a real disk. So that's why it is called a pseudo disk. The pseudo disk is falling quickly towards uh, the center due to the lack of uh, support, and it's dragging the magnetic field with it. So that's basically pinching the magnetic field. So uh, this is a cartoon illustrating the physics of the pseudo disk. So without any turbulence, everything just tried to go to the center, and uh, the pseudo disk would basically drag the magnetic field line with it and then pinch the magnetic field. Um, it is easier for the gas to flow along the magnetic field line than to flow across the magnetic field line. So the pseudo disk is a natural place for the gas to concentrate. And this is also the reason why the pseudo disk is, uh, appears to be denser than the background. So the features of the pseudo disk is essentially it is uh, denser in the background and it is also located at where the magnetic field line pinches. But uh, we do see uh, turbulence in a uh, giant molecular cloud and these turbulence would be adhered uh, to, the, to the smaller scale, to the star forming scales. So uh, we have models uh, with an initial turbulence of Mach 1 in the simulation. And this uh, initial turbulence is added as a velocity field at t equal to zero, so basically just as an initial kick, and no driven turbulence at, at later times. The subsequent evolution is self-consistent uh, without any driven turbulence. Now, with the turbulence, the uh, nice thin equatorial pseudo disk is warped into these uh, uh, into these filaments in two D. This is also a slice through the meridian plane through the star. So we, now we see the star, uh, the, the the disk in the center, the real disk, and uh, the filaments. But these uh, filaments are actually connected structures in 3D. So here is a 3D rendering. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, a, a 3D rendering of these uh, of these filaments in 3D. So uh, these filaments, uh, we call them the uh, gravel magneto sheetless because they look like sheets. They they are uh, sheet like in 3D, and they share the similar physics as the pseudo disk which means that they are formed because of the collapse, uh, because of gravity, and also because of the pinch of the magnetic field lines. 
So we named this structure the gravel magneto uh, sheetlets. These gravel magneto sheetlets, uh, yeah, they uh, dominate the mass and many field uh, transport. So for example, this structure that you see over here contains 70% of the mass in the photocell envelope, yet it only occupies, well, that's <laughs> yet it only occupies a slightly smaller, uh, a, 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 a comparatively tiny region. And because they are where the mass concentrate, they appear to be less uh, magnetized compared to the background. And unlike a pseudo disk, so basically uh, it feeds the disk. So we have the disk in the center, and then the, the pseudo disk just basically feeds the disk from the equatorial region. Um, this sheetless, they feed the disk from all directions, especially from the upper and lower surfaces. So uh, these direct feeding kind of onto the, onto the disk, onto the inner disk, uh, can facilitate disk, dyna disk dynamics and create and then make the disk more structured. And observationally, they can be the accretion streamers uh, if we project them into 2D. So that's the properties of the uh, gram gram magnetic sheetlet. And we also have non-ideal MHD effect in our simulation. So what does non-ideal MHD uh, effect play? So from the uh, left to right, we have models uh, with a larger annual productivity with stronger non-ideal MHD effect. And uh, to the right is smaller and uh, uh which is uh, a weaker um, non-ideal MHD effect. So with a stronger non-ideal MHD effect, um, more magnetic fields can be removed, so less magnetic fields are retained towards the center, which means that more angular momentum can be, can be retained, so we get a larger disk. In the least diffusive model, uh, it's uh, closer to the ideal MHD limit, so basically the uh, magnetic field is better coupled to the gas, and the magnetic field would, would remove the angular momentum so efficiently that we basically uh, don't really get a disk, we get a, a, a very tiny disk. So this shows the importance of non-ideal MHD effect, in particular angular poor diffusion, in redistributing the, uh, the, the magnetic field and allow the angular momentum to be retained to the formation of, uh, of, a, of a disk. So we can take a closer look at this formed disk. So on the uh, upper panels, I'm showing the uh, column densities of the disk in the, uh, small, in the less diffusive model and the more diffusive model on the right. So uh, we see that in the most diffusive model, the disk does exhibit some spiral structures. Um, however, there is also this uh, tumor Q parameter, which is a measurement of the disk gravitational stability and if uh, tumor Q is greater than one, that means the disk is gravitationally stable. Uh, whereas if the uh, Q is less than one, that means the disk is gravitationally unstable. So uh, the lower panel shows the tumor Q parameter. And uh, as we can see, it's, it's basically red, which means that uh, everything is greater than one. Uh, the, all the disks, even though there are some spiral structures formed, uh, they are still tumor Q stable. So, th so this shows that uh, even, even if the disk can have some uh, substructure forming, it doesn't necessarily mean that the disk is gravitationally unstable. And uh, we can also look at how uh, the transportation of, uh, of angular momentum in the disk. So these uh, disk substructures form or, form or these spirals form because the disk wants to transport angular momentum from one place to another, but, angular, but magnetic field can also uh, uh, transport angular momentum. So uh, this plot is showing the cumulative torque on the disk. So this is uh, basically, imagine the disk is uh, kind of a cylinder, and this is the total torque within a cylinder of a certain radius, uh, with the solid lines showing the uh, magnetic torque and the dashed lines showing the, gra uh, the, the gravitational torque. In the model with standard and, uh, and slightly more uh, angular diffusivity, the magnetic field dominates angular momentum transport across all radii, Whereas uh, in the most diffusive model, uh, in the inner parts of the disk, the gravity can be comparable to magnetic field transport, but magnetic field is still the only method to transport uh, angular momentum away from the disk. So that's the, that's the uh, towards a larger radii where the magnetic field dominates. So this shows uh, the importance of uh, magnetic field in the evolution of these newly formed photostellar disks.
Now, in all these models that I showed, there's only one star and uh, one disk spoon. But uh, most stars are in binary or multiple systems. So how do they form? And uh, can we use our model to, some, to say something about their formation? In particular, there are some observed systems. For example, this uh, L4048 RS3B observed at 879 microns. So uh, this is a very close uh, multiple systems with at least three stars um, on the order of 100 AU scale. And more intriguingly is this system have uh, misaligned polystellar disks. So which means that even though they are pretty close uh, on, on the order of 100 AU scale, their disks are misaligned by, uh, by, by some degrees. So can we say something about uh, 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 the formation of these objects? So we use a, a similar machinery to study uh, multiple formation. Um, so we also start from a pseudo-binary hypersphere, uh, just with slightly more mass and, uh, and a slightly higher in, in, in initial rotation rate to facilitate multiple formation. And we also exper experimented with different amicorial diffusion coefficient to see what is the effect of non-ideal MHD in the process of multiple formation. So an overview. So in the models with a larger amiporal diffusivity, for example, this is um, the, the two times or 10 times amiporal diffusivity, we do have multiple stars formed. So this is at least three stars. Uh, and in, in the middle, we have five stars. And uh, on the right, we also have uh, five stars. So how, so how does this system form, in, at least in our simulation? So in order to form multiple objects, info towards the primary must be stopped somehow. So if all the mass just simply goes to the center, then there's really nothing, no, there's no mass to form anything else. So how can we stop the info? And rotation is a natural candidate to stop the info towards the primary. So we identify this structure in between this shitlet uh, that I talked about earlier, uh, that's dominating the uh, mass and uh, magnetic field transport in the photocenter envelope and the real disk and the star uh, that's in the middle. So we identify a structure in the middle that we call the dense rotation dominated structure or the drilled. So that's a 3D rendering of this uh, drilled structure. And this drilled is rotationally supported against claps towards the primary and dynamics within the drilled would fragment into multiple objects. Some properties of the drilled. Um, so the drilled is rotation supported against claps towards the primary, which gives the gas in the drilled ample time to evolve and become companion objects. And this is also not a flat structure, not like a disk uh, that is very flat. And it is also very dynamically active. And because it is very dynamically active, there can be filaments forming in the drilled, and then the filaments can collide with each other, and then uh, multiples or secondaries can form on the collision site. So here is a movie showing the, a collision event. So the blue dots over there are showing the progenitors of the fifth companion, uh, and basically the filament collision gives birth to the fifth companion. There's also a collision down there. That's the formation of the fourth companion, uh, where two filaments collided uh, within the drill. So um, so the fragmentation or uh, multiple formation happens during this dynamically active uh, rotation supported structure, um, the, 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 the dense rotation dominated structure, the, the drilled. So does having a drilled automatically means that we have multiple objects? The answer is no. So um, a drilled also forms in the least amiporal diffusive model. So this is the, la uh, the, the least uh, amiporal diffusive model. Um, but there is no secondary form in this, uh, in, in this model. So for example, that uh, green region circled, uh, circled out, that's a place where two filaments just collided uh, in the least diffusive model. However, no secondary pop-up uh, at the location. So, so, why, so, 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 so why is it the case? And the reason is because the magnetic field is resisting the collapse. 
So uh, on the right, I'm showing the, uh, the plasma beta, which is a, the ratio between the thermal pressure and the magnetic pressure with a large value of plasma beta. Uh, magnetic field is not important. The magnetic pressure is not important. Uh, and with a low value of plasma beta, uh, magnetic field is very important. And magnetic pressure is basically can resist uh, anything from collapsing. So on the top, we have uh, the, the, the circle region where a collision just happened uh, turns blue, which means that it has a high value of plasma beta. Uh, magnetic field is not important during that, uh, in, in that region. Whereas in the lower panel, the, uh, the, the gas is basically red, it's just a, a marginal region is blue, which means that magnetic field is resisting uh, that region from becoming a secondary. So we can again also look at the tumor Q parameter. Uh, we can, because this is a rotationally supported structure, we can analyze the drill as if it were a disk. So, uh, so the first two panels, uh, uh, the, the first two panels on the left showing the uh, column density in the more diffusive model, the, the more diffusive model and the uh, less diffusive model. And the middle panel is showing the tumor Q parameter, the, 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 the usual tumor Q parameter. And again, a tumor Q parameter greater than one means that the disk or this structure is stable, whereas the tumor Q parameter of less than one means that uh, structure is unstable. So immediately, uh, we can see that there are some blue regions, which means that in this region, tumor Q can be less than one. Uh, this is uh, immediately different from the single formation case, where even if we get a very large disk, the disk is totally gravitationally stable. We can also introduce a tumor QM parameter. Uh, so one parameter in the tumor Q is the sound speed, and we can replace it with the fast uh, magnetos uh, with the, uh, the the alpha speed, which is uh, usually fast, uh, which is faster. So uh, so so with that, uh, most of the region become uh, stable. So uh, most of the region becomes red, but there's still a large region in the more diffusive model uh, that's that's still blue. So adding the magnetic field uh, doesn't help that region because it is demagnetized. Uh, there's not much magnetic field in it. So, uh, so, so that region is still gravitationally unstable. And this is also another reason why it uh, would fragment into a secondary object. And um, observationally, this is also agree with the uh, observation. For example, this is the tumor Q parameter estimated for the uh, L1448 RS3B for this uh, triple system. And, uh, in, and then, there, and then uh, the estimated tumor Q is also less than one uh, in this multiple system. So we can again look at uh, the, uh, the magnetic field transport uh, or the angular momentum transport uh, via gravity and uh, via a magnetic field. So in this case, the disk is tumor Q unstable, which means that magnetic, uh, which which means that uh, gravity or the disk is gravitationally unstable. But even in this case, magnetic field is still dominating angular momentum transport. So the solid lines are showing the uh, angular momentum transportation by magnetic field, whereas the dashed lines are showing the angular momentum transport by gravity. So in all these models, uh, magnetic field line wins by a lot. Uh, except for the most diffusive model, again, in the inner region, magnetic field and gravity can be comparable to each other, but magnetic field is still dominating at a larger radius. So magnetic field is very important, even though uh, these uh, systems, they can be tumor Q unstable. So, so one consequence of this drill fragmentation mechanism is it can produce 100 AU scale uh, multiple systems. And, but more intriguingly is it can produce uh, 100 AU misaligned, uh, multiple systems with misaligned polystyric disks. So these factors are pointing at the disk direction in our model. And as we can see, the disk directions can be offset by even 90 degrees, for example, that blue arrow over there. So the drill fragmentation mechanism can produce uh, these uh, misaligned systems, for example, this um, L4048 RS3B. So uh, we believe that uh, these, uh, these close and misaligned systems are formed through this drilled fragmentation mechanism. So currently, um, uh, oh, oh yeah, okay. So, uh, so this is a, a summary of uh, this, uh, from the molecular cloud scale to the formation of stars and disks. 
So in the single formation case, we have the gravel magneto sheetlet. Uh, so here's the, the 3D rendering. And in the multiple formation case, we have the drilled fragmentation mechanism, which may, which has this extra structure, the drilled, between the uh, sheetlet on the outside and the, uh, and the star and disk in, in the inside. So currently, uh, because this, um, yeah. So currently, because uh, because the column density in our simulation looks somewhat like uh, that uh, observed system, uh, we try to see if we can connect our models with uh, observation. So one question that we can ask is, uh, can we actually estimate the many the many field strength using the observable quantities? So uh, I've demonstrated that many field is very important in star formation, and so can we say something about uh, their strength in this uh, form system. So currently I'm working with an undergraduate student at uh, Wuhan University to investigate uh, this question. And um, uh, and for the multiple, uh, and the form, for the formed multiple systems, uh, what are the final fate of these multiple systems? So uh, can, so for example, this is a uh, uh, a five body system, which is uh, not particularly gravitationally stable. So can uh, so will it be ejected? How uh, what's the likelihood of uh, the of these wider companions be ejected? And um, these formed and 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 these multiples formed in our simulation typically have a mass ratio between uh, between the companion and the primary of about uh, one to ten. So uh, the formed um, uh, companions are relatively massive, but. Can this drilled fragmentation mechanism produce planet size objects? For example, the companion and the primary have a mass ratio of one to 1,000. Then that would be basically the mass of a Jupiter. So can, uh, so can we ex extend this drilled fragmentation mechanism to a direct formation mechanism of giant planets? So these are uh, some future directions uh, of, these, uh, of this project. So that's all for the uh, for the largest scale from the molecular cloud scale to the formation of uh, stars and disks. And now I will switch, uh, switch gear to a smaller scale to the disk scale, where I talk about the uh, grand growth in protostellar disks. So um, so there are observations of uh, early uh, planet formation uh, of of large dust grains in uh, in protostellar environments. But there are also observations of early planet formation, of possible early planet formation in uh, class zero phases. So for example, this is a very young system uh, with age less than 500,000 years old. Uh, and there's already recent gaps forming. So if these recent gaps are actually opened by planets, that means planet formation must have happened uh, less than 500,000 years into the evolution of the system, which means that grand growth uh, must have happened faster and even earlier. So can grand growth, this first step towards planet formation, happen uh, during the class zero phase, going from the interstellar medium size, typically on the order of 10 to the minus four uh, centimeter to uh, millimeter or centimeter size uh, required to generate uh, the subsequential uh, 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 evolutions. So to investigate this question, we uh, produce a gas model, uh, that's a radiation hydrodynamic model, and a dust model that post process this gas model to simulate grand growth. So here is an overview of the uh, gas setup. So we have a, uh, so this is a 2D axisymmetric model in spherical polar coordinates, taking advantage that the uh, spherical polar coordinates uh, automatically concentrates uh, the resolution towards the center, and uh, we and the uh, total mass of the system is one point six seven solar mass, and start out with a singular isothermal sphere. So the density is uh, one of R squared, dropping as the as the power law, and we simulate the region from ten to one thousand AU, covering the uh, the the, the, the interclap space. So here's an overview of the uh, gas result. So this is an alpha disk model. Uh, so basically the magnetic field is uh, replaced by a simpler description, the alpha viscosity, to model the angular momentum transport within the disk, which greatly reduces the 
uh, the, the computational cost. So a uh, disk forms and grows in our model. And we post-process this disk model to uh, model dust evolutions. So this, um, so this dust model is a post-processing model of the hydro simulation, and we simulate the dust as precious fluid. So, uh, so just like the gas, uh, how we model the gas is basically having the gas uh, advect from one cell to another. This is uh, modeled in a similar way that the gas density, uh, that the dust density and dust momentum can transport from one cell to another to model the advection of dust. To simulate uh, grain growth, to model grain growth, we discretize the dust into 105, 105 size beams from 0.1 microns to one centimeter, covering the entire range of, uh, of dust grain size interest. And uh, the, the dust model shares the same uh, resolution as the hydro, and uh, the grain growth is simulated by solving the velocity coagulation equation. Uh, or in other words, basically, the, uh, not only can the uh, grains uh, uh, the, the, the grain mass can be advected across space, it can be also be advected across the grain sizes. So basically, a smaller grain can grow to a larger size. And um, so, and the, mod, the grain growth model taken in our simulation is the simplest model, which is uh, we assume that the grains collide and grow to do their relative drift speed different in gas. So for example, if I have a bunch of gas, just like in this room, and I have gravity pointing down, and a larger grain would fall faster uh, due to gravity than the smaller grain. So they would collide, and that's basically the grain growth. And as an upper limit for the grain growth rate, we assume that if a collision happened, then these two grains will just merge together. And so basically, we assume uh, sticking only in this model as the upper limit to the grain growth rate. So if we just put in everything into the simulation and having uh, the original grain size from 0.1 micron to one centimeter, and all these larger dust grains are, uh, are formed due to grain growth, then we, we don't get uh, many large grains in our disk. So as we can see over here, only uh, a couple of 10 uh, micron size grains are formed, whereas there's basically uh, nothing on the larger grain side. Now, if we increase the grain growth rate by a factor of four, then we can actually get some large dust grains. So, um, so basically, we can get some millimeter size grains uh, pretty fast. And, uh, and in the later evolution, we can even get some centimeter size grains. So why is that? Why is grain growth slow in uh, this laminar polycellar disk? And why is a factor of four increase in grain growth rate is sufficient to produce these large grains? So to answer this question, we have to go back to the uh, Somolovsky coagulation equation that's governing the grain growth. So this is the most general form of the Somolovsky coagulation equation. And uh, I know this is a double integral. It's uh, kind of nasty. So I can decompose it into three terms. So the IJK represents uh, grains of different sizes. So SI is, uh, say, a grains of a certain size, and SJ and SK are grains of other sizes. The left-hand side is DMKDT, which is the change of uh, number density of the case uh, dust species. So that's basically modeling uh, the, basically the, the, the growth. And then this M, IJK, is the kernel, which, is, which, which describes the collision result of the species I and J. So for example, that's the Fermi diagram for, uh, for, grain, for grain growth. So we have uh, grains of SI and SJ collide uh, in the middle, and then it produces a bunch of uh, other grains, and one of them is SK, and uh, it is of size SK. So this MIJK basically uh, is, describes what happens during this uh, magical event. And NI and NJ are basically the number density. So that's essentially just the, 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 the collision likelihood of these um, uh, uh, of the uh, grains of size i and j. So just by examining this equation, we see that uh, the keys to grain growth is basically this m, which is uh, which describes what happens during the collision, and the number density uh, n i and n j. Now, since in our simulation we assume sticking only 
and the grand grand relative speed is proportional to the grand size difference, uh, we can actually find a semi-analytic solution to this small C coagulation equation. So before I go to the uh, go to the solution, uh, I would first um, I mention that the second uh, assumption that we made, which is the grand grand relative speed is proportional to the grand size difference, is equivalent to the grand grand uh, uh, size of uh, the, the grand grand uh, collision speed is proportional to uh, the stopping time difference. So the stopping time is just a measurement of uh, the level of coupling between uh, between dust and gas. So if the stopping time is really short, then that means the grains are better, it's well coupled to the gas. Whereas if the stopping time is very long, that means the, the grain doesn't really care about the gas, it just moves wherever it goes. And uh, it also proportional to the Stokes number, uh, which is also uh, a measurement of the coupling between uh, between gas and dust. So uh, assumption two is applicable uh, when we describe uh, the when, when the dust is uh, when dust relative speed is due to the drift speed, their drift speed in gas, which is the case in our simulation, and it is also uh, applicable applicable in some regimes in turbulence. So for example, uh, there's the Omer and Cousy 2020, uh, 2020 2007 paper. Uh, so in, in some of the turbulence regimes, uh, this uh, this analytic solution also applies. So here is a uh, an overview of the uh, of the result. So if we make these two simple assumptions and then um, and then and then, um, and then start from essentially any distribution, any side grand, grand mass dis distribution as a function of grand size. So that's the different Q, that's the uh, different starting point. Then no matter what initial condition we start with, we always end up with this same curve. And this same curve would move to the larger grand side in, at a constant speed in log space, in, in uh, log log space of grand size. So in order to calculate the grand growth rate, we can define a T growth, a growth time for one size decade. So basically the time for the peak to move from, for example, in this case, 10, uh, 0 0.1 millimeter to one millimeter. And the speed is given by this equation over here. So I can also decompose it into different components. So the, so the upper side are the gas density and the gas uh, thermal speed. So these are the gas properties. And uh, on the on, on the denominator we have the um, the grand number density, so that's the the red term, and then this cosi is the collision term. That's basically basically the proportional coefficient. So basically, if I know the dust to gas ratio and so the gas properties, and I make some assumptions about how they collide, then we, I can immediately calculate what is the grand growth time scale in our simulation or in any environment. So we'll ap apply this theory into our simulation and calculate uh, what is a typical uh, grand growth time scale in the simulation. So we find that in this, um, uh, the, the typical grand growth time scale in the simulation is greater than 0 0.3 million years, which is greater than a typical class zero uh, lifetime, which means that uh, there is insufficient time for, the, for dust grains to grow from micron size to centimeter size in this simulation. And this result also agrees with our global simulation that we don't see any large dust grains in our simulation. And a factor of four increase would basically shrink this time of 0 0.3 million years into a time less than 0 0.1 million years, which is now within the, uh, a typical class zero time. And uh, so that's why a factor of four increase in grain growth rate can produce these millimeter or centimeter size grains. So a summary for the uh, for the grain growth part. Um, so if we make two assumptions, uh, one is sticking only, so as long as two grains collide, they will stick to each other as the upper limit of grain growth rate. And the grain grain relative speed is proportional to the grain size difference. Then there is a characteristic speed uh, or characteristic time that the grains would grow from one size to another. And this time is characterized by uh, that expression. Uh, grain growth uh, is slow in laminar photostandard disks, so we need some ways to increase the grain growth rate if we believe that large dust grains exist in photostandard environments. And, uh, and this T-growth is showing that if we want to increase the grain growth rate, then we have to either increase the grain concentration, so 
uh, increase the, uh, the, the rho d total, or we increase the grand grand collision speed, so increase that collision parameter. So, uh, so there are a few open questions uh, from this result. So for example, so the first one is, can turbulence actually increase the grand growth rate? So turbulence would increase the grand grand collision speed. So yes, that's uh, a favor in grand growth, but it will also stir everything up. So it will basically decrease the grand number density and decrease the grand concentration. So it's favoring one term, favoring the collision term, but decreasing the concentration term. So who, who would win? Would turbulence actually be able to increase the grand growth rate? And grand growth is also affecting the disk chemistry and observed disk composition. The grand surface is a unique environment for certain chemical reactions. So can uh, so we can can we actually constrain the grand growth model using uh, some chemistry model? And uh, can the drug fermentation mechanism actually alleviate the need for early grand growth altogether? So if these early planets that we see are actually formed by direct gravitational collapse, then there's no need for early, early grand growth. Maybe grains doesn't grow as fast, and the uh, observational evidence are just some optical, uh, optical depth effect. And these early planets that we see is formed through another mechanism other than the usual uh, mechanism. So uh, last but not least, I will uh, briefly talk about uh, jets, how jets are launched in uh, young stellar objects. So jets are uh, observed if we took, uh, uh, everywhere in uh, around young stellar objects. And just like in with magnetic field, we always have the magnetic flux problem. Um, so if we drive all the magnetic field, uh, field towards the center, then the magnetic field will be so strong that it would destroy the disk and, uh, and uh, potentially choke the jet. So can we, uh, so can we alleviate the magnetic flux problem? And also just uh, what happens in this uh, region very close to the star in this jet launching region. And more intriguingly, uh, related to this question is the discovery of the calcium aluminum rich inclusion chondroids. So on my hand is a piece of the Yande uh, meteorite. Uh, so that's a picture of this particular meteorite. And it, it contains these white droplets uh, that's called a sea ice. These droplets are believed to have been melted uh, by high temperature in the uh, early solar system by a temperature of, of by over 1,000 Kelvin. But this temperature is not uh, achievable anywhere else other than in the vicinity of the star, since you know, this is a very high temperature. So how does, the, how does these um, droplets be so close to the star yet appear in my hands today? So to investigate these questions, we, um, we uh, produce, a, as a first step, we produce a, a 2D model uh, in the vicinity of the star. So uh, we include two regions. One is a thermally activated uh, active zone and a, uh, and a, uh, and a dead zone uh, be, uh, at the larger radius. So the active zone is, is a region where the temperature is high enough such that the ionization is uh, enough to keep this region in the ideal energy limit. Whereas the dead zone is where this ionization is insufficient and uh, not the energy effect can remove the magnetic field very easily. So uh, we do have a jet in our simulation. So this is a rendering of the jet. It's a pretty powerful jet with a speed greater than 10 to the seven centimeters per second throughout the simulation. And we believe the jet is launched by the so-called avalanche accretion stream. So this is a movie of, uh, of the simulation and the avalanche accretion stream is essentially this accretion stream on the, uh, on the disk surface. And we can examine one frame uh, closely to look at the physics of this avalanche accretion stream. So here is, a, here is one frame. It's taking a while. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, with magnetic field lines uh, superposed onto it. So here is the avalanche accretion stream. It's dragging the magnetic field lines, which means that, uh, which uh, is the reason why the magnetic field lines are pinched on the avalanche accretion stream. And there's a very fast outflow launched above this avalanche accretion stream. That's where the VRs are uh, red uh, of a speed of 10 to the seven. And there's also an excessive of angular momentum. So that's uh, basically the, uh, so that's the uh, that plot on the right showing the specific angular momentum. There's also an excess of angular momentum uh, of the gap above the avalanche accretion stream. So the physics of avalanche accretion stream and why it's an avalanche 
is because it is a positive feedback loop between infall and magnetic field uh, removal uh, and, and magnetic field removing angular momentum. So imagine you have some parts of gas that's infalling, drag the magnetic field with it. Uh, as the gas infall, it would drag the magnetic field and make the magnetic field line becomes more become more pin, uh, becomes more pinched. This more pinched field would remove angular momentum faster from the gas, which makes the gas infall even faster. So this is a positive feedback loop that the gas is infalling and dragging the magnetic field constantly. So that's why it is uh, called an avalanche of condition. Basically, once it starts, then there's no way to stop it. And part of the angular momentum removed from this avalanche of cuisine stream can be transported uh, upward by the magnetic field. And that's basically uh, what's launching the jet magnetic, magnetic centrifugally uh, from, this, uh, from this inner disk region. So what does this avalanche of cuisine stream power jet uh, imply? So uh, despite all the disadvantages of 2D simulations, there's one advantage uh, of 2D simulation which is we can actually trace the evolution of individual magnetic field lines. So this is a movie showing the evolution of uh, magnetic field lines. And as we can see, magnetic reconnection is constantly happening. So even though this avalanche accretion stream is bringing mass towards the center, the magnetic field is not dragged with it. And because the magnetic reconnection is uh, redistributing the magnetic field outward. And this magnetic reconnection is also a very energetic event, which means that it could provide a alternative heating source for this country formation. So now you, you, we don't have to get that, that close to the star in order to form this country. And there's also an outflow mechanism. So there's also a redistribution of, uh, a mechanism for uh, making them available to us today. So uh, some future directions for this jet, uh, uh, jet launching model. So can this avalanche equation stream model still hold in 3D uh, since uh, right now we are uh, only have a 2D model? And because this place is also very close to the star, so the, uh, what role does the magneto, uh, the magneto sphere of the star play in, uh, in the jet launching? And, uh, and the transportation of the CIs, can these uh, jets or uh, the outflows actually can transport these small particles away from this very uh, extreme region? So here's a summary of, uh, of this talk. So on the largest scale, we have uh, we find the gravel magneto sheetless dominating the polar stellar envelope. And, uh, and in the multiple formation case, we identify the structure in, in, in between, that's called the drill, and the drill fragments into multiple objects. Uh, in the in the media scale, in the grand growth scale, we find a uh, an analytic solution to the Smolovsky coagulation equation. And uh, and that um, and that analytic solution can explain why grand growth is slow in lambda polar disks. And finally, in the inner disks uh, region, we identify this avalanche cuisine stream power jet model, uh, uh, explaining how jets are launched from a young stellar object. So thank you very much for listening to me. And uh, here's the movie. <laughs> yeah. So here's a movie I made for the true presentation mechanism. It's a comedy movie, so I want to play it first time. And uh, yeah, it's really hard. So for example, here is the joke, and here is the formation of the first companion. Uh, it's a pretty cool movie, so uh, uh, feel free to scan scan the QR code. It is also in the appendix of my 2024B paper, uh, so feel free to check it out and. Uh, Thank you very much. And I'm also available today at uh, room 331 if you want to chat with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions in the room? Or... Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I have a couple of questions, but uh, probably just ask one for now. So I'm curious in uh, like uh, this multiple star forming together like system. What is the initial parameters that you think would define whether it's like forming multiple system or just a uh, singular? Um, I think it's a uh, rotation. So because basically we have to stop the info towards the primary somehow, and just and have the gas to have enough time to to evolve. So uh, so th th there are two, two uh, there are two main differences between the single forming and multiple forming. One is the mass, and one is the, the the rotation. And personally, I think the rotation is playing a uh, a, a larger role in forming these uh, companions. 
Yeah, but I think mass also fun because you do need more mass. <laughs> like you, uh, the, the more mass, the, 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 the easier the fermentation. I can have a ask for that. So can you, uh, what's your comments on like uh, multiplicity related to the standard mass? Because we know that more massive stars are tend to be like binary or triple systems, but the like low mass stars, like very low mass stars, they're more mostly just the single ones. Yeah. So, um, so I think more mass, um, uh, it, it it does help in um in, in multiple formations. That's why we we, we do include more mass, and um, uh, there's also the magnetic field. So, uh, so uh, since you have more mass, and if you have the same same amount of magnetic field, then relatively speaking, magnetic field is less important. Uh, so which means that if the if everything else is equal, just basically have more mass, then more angular momentum can be affected at to a to a smaller radius. So it so it will be easier for a more massive system to become multiples, and also um, and also becoming a star is also easier with more mass uh, since uh, you need uh, enough mass to actually trigger nuclear fusion. So in a, a lower mass uh, 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 regime, you may get, you you may only get a Jupiter or get something smaller that uh, that you don't see as a secondary object that it may be just a planet. Uh, Caitlin. <laughs> Sorry, I hit the wrong button to unmute. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. I had sort of two questions. So first, maybe you said it at the very beginning, but what was the, what is this thermodynamics that you're using in the simulations? Oh, so for, for, for this uh, multiple forming simulation? Yeah. Uh, so we assume a, uh, a, 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 um, uh, a, a, I want to say broken. It's a, it's a power law uh, distribution. So in the protostellar envelope, it's pretty much uh, isothermal at 10 K. But then within the disk, the temperature can go up uh, a little bit because of the equilibrium state. So, yeah, it's, so, it's, so it's just a broken power law, but a, but purely barotropic. Yeah, yeah. And no cooling. Uh, no. OK, interesting. Yeah. So then my, my second question is, I wasn't really sure why you needed to create a new class of object called a drode. If it's a rotationally supported object, what makes it not just a massive disk? And what differentiates what you're calling filaments from spiral arms, for example? Yeah. So in the so so in the single formation case, we also have a disk. Uh, so so that is a pretty large disk with uh, some spiral arms in in, in there. But those structures they don't uh, become secondaries. So a drill, we distinguish a drill from a disk because a drill is much a, a lot more dynamically active than a disk. And so so that's why the filament collision within the drill can become secondaries, whereas the dynamics within a disk won't become a secondary. But I mean that's but I guess why right there, there's there's been quite a lot of work on fragmenting disks. So why do you want to call it something else, right? You can get violent spiral instability, you know, violent gravitational or gravitomagnetic instabilities in a disk. So why yeah. call it something else? Yeah, we just want to highlight uh, this difference. And uh, also this is the, also a 3D structure. So uh, the disk is uh, uh, pretty flat and uh, this is also a very, um, a not so fast structure. So we want to highlight the difference between that and a, a traditional disk. I mean, people have, people have, you know, there's a lot of work on aspect disks with aspect ratios of 30% or something, right? That's, that wouldn't be the first time. So I just be, you know, be wary of that, you know, creating a new name for something that definitely already exists. Yeah, I, 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 I yeah, I, I do share your concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we can just discuss that later. I mean, I'm pretty open this afternoon. So if you want to discuss. Um, are there any other questions in the room? Well, um, so very nice talk. I was wondering uh, with your last part of the talk, uh, did you mean the reconnection events can uh, can keep those gas up to a thousand to thousand of months so that you can have those CIs as a mechanism to create those CIs? Yeah. And in your simulation, do you track the temperature or reconnected part of the gas? Yeah, so so for now, uh, we didn't tr uh, track the temperature itself consistently. So this is uh, so we assume that the temperature is um, a 
uh, a, a spatial, well, a spatially fixed value. So basically, we assume that the active zone is uh, above uh, about 1,200 uh, Kelvin, and then the dead zone is uh, less than that, and then the uh, envelope is uh, about 3,000 Kelvin. We will assume that temperature is fixed, just so you uh, have a better numerical stability and runability of the simulation. Otherwise, the simulation can easily break uh, very early uh, during, during the simulation. But we did, did track, for example, the plasma beta, which shows the relative importance between the magnetic field and gas. And in these stress launching regions, plasma beta is very low. So there's, uh, not, so there's abundant of uh, magnetic energy to heat the gas up if this magnetic energy can be released as thermal energy. Yeah. Oh, sorry, a small part of it, I'm sorry. Yeah, very, very small part of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, very strong field. Yes, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. And you think those strong field energy will convert into thermal energy eventually? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and some of the loops are dissipating. So, for example. Are there any other questions in the room? Uh, I guess I'm trying to understand more about the difference between the single and multiple formation, because it seems like in the first case you do have a disk and filaments and. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to isolate what exactly is not allowing you to form planets or other other stars in that case. Is it just you said more rotation, obviously? Um, but does that change the, the density profile sufficiently to stop you from forming multiple stars in a single case? Or? Um. So in, so in a single formation case, uh, so in some cases we do get a large disk. But then the, that disk is not dynamically enough, or the or or is gravitationally stable, so that uh so so that you won't, yeah. So 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 that even though there are substructures uh like that, it won't actually fragment into uh into uh, multiple objects, yeah. So 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 rotation is uh I guess one part of the answer to why uh, uh why the uh in why multiple forms in uh, those set of simulation, but there's also these dynamics. So basically this collision and being tumor Q unstable, being very dynamically active, and that's contributing to the rows. Um, also the filaments in the single formation case, they are basically the uh, sheetlets. They are the rotation unsupported structure quickly infolding towards the uh, to, towards the star and disks. So unlike in the uh, in the multiple star formation case where the filament is basically a part of the drode, um, in the single formation case, the the, fil the filaments or the sheetless, they are basically the polycyclic envelope. Uh, so so na uh, naturally they are uh, they are different. Does does that address your question? So I also uh, I guess to extend that, um, what is making Q so large in, in sort of these simulations? Is it, is it the density? Is it the sound speed? Uh, I, I think it's going to. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure you're on top, on exactly on top of my head. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's probably the, uh, like the gravity is, 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 is large enough for the, uh, from, from, from just the primary star that it is, uh, gravitation, gravitationally stable. So, um, yeah, so, so, so basically we can also measure, for example, um, uh, uh, the, the, the tidal force. The, the the force gradient and the force gradient in a disk will be very large. So basically, if one if something tries to form in there, then the tidal force will just shear it apart. But then in a draw, because uh, the uh, protostar is relatively less massive, and then and uh, the that rotation supported structure also forms at an earlier stage. Um, uh, basically, the tidal force there won't be too strong to that I would disrupt uh, that becoming a secondary. Um, it is just after one o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and end it there. If anybody has any other questions for Ishan or um, wants to discuss further, uh, you, you will be here uh, the rest of today and tomorrow morning until about 11. Um, and his email is on the meeting sign-up sheet, so if you can't meet with him while he's here or you're online and physically are not here, 
uh, his email is is available if you want to email him directly. So let's say uh, thank you once again to Ishan. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes.